Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a retake on Monday night's class because I did such a horrible job. There you go. Finished. That's why. Um, <laughs> it was a horrible job, and it is very... Uh, it helps explain why you never take an antihistamine before you have to go do something where you have to use your brain. Um, I was I had taken an antihistamine right before class, along with something that I use for um, I have a heart murmur and it's supposed to keep it under control. So I had two things in my system that cause you to get stupid. And I was stupid Monday night. So I'm going to reshoot it all here and I'm going to walk you through uh how to do this. I'm going to walk you through to show you where things are, and I'm going to basically do this one because it's the easiest one for me to show you how to do. You may create your own game, and I'll show you that in a second, using this code, or if you're up to it, there's the full code right there. Not only does this um, not only does this allow you to keep score, you get so many fish, it starts over. I mean, it's this is the full this is a full game right here. Now, so what are we asking you to do? What we're asking you to do is to change up some of the variables in this. So, as you can see here, and we'll be talking about this you have two different protagonists and antagonists in this particular game. You can make it whatever you want it to be. If you want your shark to be a dinosaur, if you want your shark to be an octopus, if you want it to be whatever you want it to be, I want you to change it up. Because all of this code that you see here work. Okay? And the same thing with the other one. That's a little more involved. Uh, if you want to program that one up just change it up somehow um, you could change it so that the sound here which is located in the fish code that says if on edge bounce and then it says play sound gong if you want to make your sound something else you know that's another way that you could change it up okay so let's talk about what we're looking at here Coding is all the rage right now. The state of Kentucky has a very, I think, bragging rights on the fact that it has more young women taking coding in classes than any other state in the United States. I think that's worth, uh, you know, saying that a boy because I think it's really important. There are many kinds of programming languages. That's the other thing people get very confused about. What we're going to be using tonight is something called OOPS programming, object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is also seen in something called RCX, Mindstorms, goes by a couple of other names. These are Lego-based, and basically you're just pulling over little pieces of code, and you're linking them together, and then you run it. Very, very, it's, it's nice because it's very... Uh, analogous to what you have to do when you write real code. The difference is when you're writing real code, nobody gives you these little bits. You have to actually create the little bits yourself. So in elementary school, we see kids involved in something every year called the Hour of Code. Uh, in some schools, this just takes place in the elementary school lab. Uh, other schools, they do a whole the whole day. No, not the whole day, excuse me. Everybody in the day um, takes the time off and they actually do this hour of code. And I'll show you what it looks like here in just a second. In middle school, kids get exposed, in elementary school, kids also get exposed to the RCX coding, the which is how you build the little Lego robots. Uh, and in some elementary schools, kids actually start programming with something called VEX, Robot C. VEX is just a name of a system, just like Lego is a name of a system. Um, VEX reminds me of the old uh, toys that I used to have when I was a kid. Not that I had a robot building kit, but we called them erector sets. And you basically put together pieces of metal and you built things out of them. 
So what VEX does is it takes that concept and then puts in a controller, uh, puts in a way for you to program that, uh, puts in motors and wheels and so on. So it uses something called Robot C, which is C plus language, but it is all done with drop downs and things like that. And you can also program your VEX robots using straight up C plus. Now you'll see that in some elementary schools, you see it a lot in middle schools. And then at the high school level, it's pretty much a, the coding classes there are pretty much um, Python, um, Linux, and C++. So there you go. That, that is what coding looks like in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We have competitions here in Jefferson County um, in February where we have what we call the Robo Rumble. I was a part of the team that developed all that. And I love it to death. It, it's, it's a competition um, for kids to get to show off how to do something that, that is a challenge. Now, I have, I have some problems with it because I don't think it goes enough, far enough with that idea. In my brain, the way it should be done is here's a, here's a prompt, here's a challenge. I'll go build a robot that will do something. Instead, this is a series of little uh, challenges that the kids have to do, which I don't know. I, I think it kind of is very derivative. It's it, like last year's they had a, uh, the whole thing was like the, remember the game operation that you had to take the funny bone out and you had to be careful not to hit the sides and it would make it buzz. Well, last year's competition was kind of like, you're going to do things that have a human body relationship and like you're going to move stuff around so on. I, I really have been lobbying hard for the idea that we need to build a robot to meet a need. Uh, that need could be everything. And this is what I did with kids is I would say, all right, we need to build a robot because we have a person who is quadriplegic and you're going to build the robot so it can bring things to that person on voice command. Yet you can do that with something as simple as a Lego RCX Mindstorm set. Pretty cool. All righty, let's start with our code. So our code, as I said, has as its beginning, uh, it was in the Obama administration, and they were trying to promote kids in schools uh, learning how to code. As I said, Kentucky has a very storied history with this. We're one of the leaders in the nation. The thing that is here in this our code, and let me pop over here and click on this link so you can see it. So here are all the different our code activities. First one kids are going to go to right here is this Minecraft, which is great. Um, you can make your own maze. In other words, you can make a game here. What's really interesting about this codable is this is an offshoot of something that Microsoft had uh, called Codu, K-O-D-U, and it was a way to build uh, true first-person games, third-person games, um, where you could have all of the things that kids expect in a game, which became this, Minecraft. So it's kind of interesting to see the evolution of all this stuff. Uh, the one that was hot last year, of course, is right here, and that's Star Wars. Let me just pop in and let you take a look at it just so you can see. It's got lots of information for you. Click on the start. And you basically what you're doing here is you are moving blocks around. This is all flash-based, by the way. I'm not going to, you can watch the movie. Oh, listen, it plays music, which you're probably not hearing. So as you can see, what you have to do, hang on a sec, I'm turning down the music. 
it's play Star Wars music in the background. So as you can see, here's Ray, and she's telling BB-8 what, what she needs it to do to help her collect all the scrap metal that they can get. So here's our little BB-8. So he's going to need to move to go get scrap metal. So what we have to do, she says, we need all the scrap metal we can get. Can you do it? Well, right now, he needs to move right. So I'm going to drag over a little piece of code for him to move right. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to run it. And as you can see, he did it. it. Says, keep playing. All right. So now he has to go get some more scrap metal. I'm going to assume it's this right here. So I'm going to have him go down. And if you'll look over here, each one of these boxes represents a little piece of this code. So I'm going to have him go down again because it's one, two. I don't know. We'll see. And then I'm going to reset. And I'm going to run it. Oh, you know what? All it wants me to do is to go right. So I'm going to go ahead and go right again. So I'll run. There we go. So if I want to keep going now with a new challenge, I click on continue. Now we had an interesting challenge. So it wants me to go right to get this, but I also now have one down there. So let's see. Let's see what happens if I move right. And then I have to move down. And let's run it. Okay. So this is object-oriented programming. Okay. So I'm going to close that down. Play around with. One, two, three. Hello, everyone. I think we're ready to go here. Um, this is a redo of Monday night's class because it was a disaster and it was a disaster because it was my fault. Um, it is a lesson that we all know well, never, never, never take uh, an antihistamine with other medication. And I did. And my brain was just mush. I was struggling so hard just to even think, let alone actually lead the class. So those of you who were there, uh, I apologize profusely for the rest of you who were lucky enough not to be there. This is what we were trying to do that night. So let's go ahead and jump in and go to the course modules. Uh, we are going to be looking at programming and coding in schools. This is, if you want to think of it, the last frontier of what we are doing in schools. I'm not sure if anybody has figured out where it belongs in the curriculum. Is it something in math? Is it something in science? I just know that kids love doing this kind of thing to death. So what are we doing? So in this module, we're going to tell a story and create a game in Scratch to bring that story to life. Uh, what you're going to do is we're going to design it and you're going to then put it into your Google Classroom and I'll show you how to do that. Ignore in your wiki. I'll fix that. 
and you're going to basically show us your game that you have created as well as an explanation of how the game works. Now, that's kind of uh, intimidating. So what I've tried to do is here's your scaffolding right here. So this is how you're going to write your paragraph. What do we have to do? And then inside of here, I have two different levels of gameplay for you. So this is what I would call the full on scratch game. But there's the code. There's everything you need to know how to build a game with your shark attack. What you need to do is to change up some part of the code. Okay. And it can be something as when somebody, when I receive got me, it plays a sound. And this can be a different sound. You can choose a different antagonist. So if you don't want to have your shark is trying to run around and eat all the little fishies or try to get away from the fishies trying to get away from them, fine. Change it to something else. Make it a different sprite or character. If that's too intimidating, there you go. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen lines of code altogether. I'm going to show you how to do this one, the really simple one. Um, please feel free to do it, okay? But the same rule applies. You must change it up. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go ahead and change this up as I make it so that, you know, you get a sense of what I mean. Okay. So coding, where did it come from? What's it all about? The IRA code was something that started during the Obama administration as a way of trying to up the ante on what kids were learning in school. It had a direct correlation to a skill that, uh, they could use, and the IRA code was created using something called OOPS, Object-Oriented Programming. And as you can see here, I've got three links for you to go take a look at it if you want to. Uh, you don't have to do, you don't have to acknowledge you've done this or anything. I just want you to see it. And as you can see, uh, at the the IRA code are some of the hot ones are here. Here's Minecraft. Um, Codable is interesting because uh, Codable was actually something created by Microsoft. Uh, actually, it was called Codu, O-D-U, that then went on to become that, Minecraft. Uh, the one that you see originally when it first came out because of the movie, a lot of schools were doing this one. I'm not going to go too far with it. I just want you to see what it is and how it works. So as you can see, in this particular scenario, uh, Ray is giving you challenges and you are BB-8 to help do whatever the challenge is. This is what I mean by oops right here. So all the programming is already done for you. In other words, you don't, you don't have to really do anything to it. You just basically grab and drag it over and click it in. And as you can see, it takes me one, two boxes to get to the scrap metal. And then when I run it, he goes over there and gets it. And then she'll tell you, good job, keep playing. And I'll go right. And then it moves me to the next, you know, challenge. I'm just showing you this because this is object-oriented program. What we're going to be using with Scratch is also object-oriented programming. It is probably the easiest way to get kids into, well, I know it is the easiest way to get kids into coding. Um, and I still like it because when I work with kids and I talk to them about building a game, I say the first thing you need to do is to have a story. So what is the story of your game? And it throws them because they want to get going and start, you know, clicking around. No, you can't do that. You have to build a story first. It could be a simple story like this one that we're doing tonight is the story of 
uh, a shark trying to catch as many little fish as he can. So, you know, if you have to have a story, otherwise you don't know what you're creating for. In this particular game set, the story is quite large in what it can do. But let me show you how easy this is. So we're going to be going to something called Scratch at MIT. And if what I show you intimidates you, I can show you something that they've come up with that makes it even easier to do. You will need to join Scratch. So you're going to click here, and you're going to fill it in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's very easy to do. When you join the Scratch community, it's like everything else out in social media land. Uh, this is where you can share your games. So you see that a lot. Kids do that. Uh, one of the nice things about it is there are games in here. There are stories in here. As you can see up here, the drawing process. There's all kinds of different projects and niches where the projects fit in. Um, and I'm going to show you how to make one of these. What I was going to say was, if what we're going to start doing here it intimidates the heck out of you, go try this one. Okay, that, what I love about this one in particular, and you'll see in a second when we get going, is you have to know where all the little code pieces live before you can start building. Now, you can build, and, you know, I would strongly recommend that you just kind of work your way through this and find where all the pieces are. But the nice thing about this one, let me go ahead and show it to you. Is all of that coding pieces live over here in a very easy to understand menu. Okay. Over here is your stage. You know, I'll see, you'll see what that means in just a second. And this is your frame. This is where I've, th sorry, this is your stage. This is your frame. This is where the action takes place. I like this. I'm going to go back, if it'll let me. And I'm going to go create. And it's basically, you know, asking me to start my Flash player. And I have to allow it because I'm on a Mac. And boom, here we are. So this is pretty much the same thing that we just saw. It's just, I think, much, much better organized. This is where we are going to be working with our sprites, which are actually characters. This is where all the pieces are that we use to build our game, which will be over here. So this is where we'll see the action. This is where we'll build the action. So the first thing we have to do is we have to decide what our characters are going to be. Now, in this particular game that, that we've got set up here for you, it is essentially uh, a chase game. But I can show you how to make it a Frogger game. And you remember Frogger. That was the video game that everybody had to play where the, the frog had to jump across the, the street while the cars were going back and forth. It also got squished. So those are very easy to build as well. So let's go ahead and let's get right to it. So I have a sprite right here, a little kitty cat at Scratch. And I'm going to get rid of him because I don't need Scratch for what I'm doing. So I'm going to go get a sprite. And as you can see, they're all organized by animals. So I'm going to come down here, and this is where you can make yours different right away. If you want to tell a different story, you can change up your characters now. All of the uh, code that we're putting in here will work with any of these different characters, okay? Here's our guy that we're going to be working with because he's a shark. But you notice up here, there's a lion. Um, there are, where's the dragon? There is a dragon. Maybe that's over, and there's a dinosaur. Fantasy. Yeah, here we go. So in your fantasy, you've got uh, different characters. You might want to have a ghost. 
different kinds of ghosts that are chasing you. Might be a bad old witch that's chasing you. The wizard might be trying to avoid a spell cast by the bad ghost. You know, it, you can you can go so many different ways. The spaceship may be trying to dodge the asteroids. That sounds familiar. Uh, yes, you can build all those kinds of things. So I'm going to go back in here. And I'm going to build my shark code first. So I'm going to come down here. And I'm going to find my buddy. Here he is. So I'm just going to double click him. And now he pops in to my panel here. And I need to start finding the code that I'm going to use for him to be a part of this game. Now, he is my protagonist. And so I want him to be the the thing that I'm going to be controlling. Okay? I'm going to be patrol, uh, controlling what this guy does. So if I look at my code sheet, it tells me that I need to do something to tell the game that something is about to happen. And so I'm going to drag over something called the start flag, which is right here. And I'm going to put that out here on the page. I then need to teach my little sharky shark how to move. Let's take a look at that real fast. So I can have my sharky shark move 10 steps. And if I don't want him to move off the page, what I can do is I can have him go just so far, like to the edge, and then bounce back. Simple. So if I go up here and click on the flag, my sharky shark moves. Now notice he's not moving very far because he's only got 10 steps to move on. If I bring that all the way up to 50 steps, I'm moving back because he's going to take off. And I go, move, move, move. He moves faster or farther. When he gets to the edge, he flips around, comes back, move, 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 flips again. So that's, that's how easy you can make him move. Now, if you want to have him do something more interesting besides just moving back and forth on the screen, you can add in where he turns a little bit. And again, I go back up here, I click on the flag, and now he's turning. Now, even though he's turning, when he hits a edge, he bounces right back in to the game. Simple. But since I want to control this guy, I'm going to take out these pieces of code. Because what I want him to do is I want to be able to control him. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tear all this code apart. Throw it out. I'm going to keep the edge code. I'm going to take that away. Now let's try something else. What would happen if I brought in something that says that he points toward the mouse pointer? I wonder what that would look like. So I'll bring that in. I'll bring that back. And then I click on the flag. Oh. So now I can hold him and move him around on the screen just by doing that. Now, let me show you what happens if you move the step back in and you do this. As you can see, making it move that one little bit causes him now to kind of straighten up. So already, I've changed the code. If you look at the code that's in the uh, example, I don't. I, it has this all happening all the time. And what I've done here is I've basically said, no, what I want you to do is I want you to just move where I move the mouse. Now, there is, though, a bit of code that we can add to this that really does something kind of cool. And it's called Next Costume. 
Next costume is located It is located here, and I'm going to drag that in, and I'm going to put it in here. Now, when it says next costume, what it's relating to is the fact that this guy has another look to him. And so if I hit the green flag and I move him, what can happen now is every time it gets down to this line of code, it changes him. And you can work it all the way through. Isn't that cool? Now, how do I have this happen all the time? I'm going to go up here to control. And I'm going to tell it that I want this to go on forever. So I'm going to drag this over and I'm going to bring it right underneath my green flag. Because this always has to be first. And I've now told it that this is what is going to happen always forever so i click on the green flag and now i have a shark that's going blockers but he follows me around get it so he's following my code so i put him in place i hit the green flag and now he waits for me to grab him to drag him around while he's doing his craziness okay. simple as that Simple as that. Let's try it with something else, just so you can see it. So I'm going to take that off the deck, and I'm going to go find another sprite. Let's go find another sprite. Ooh. Maybe the bat does have, I don't know if the bat has multiple costumes or not. So I'm now going to get rid of my little friend here. Now i got a bat. So let's try plugging in the programming code again. Okay, so we know that the first thing we need to do is we need to go find the event, which is when the flag is clicked. Then what's the next thing we need to do? We need to go and decide how we're going to move it. And right now, we're going to ignore the uh, moving it five steps. We're just gonna say, look, if you're on an edge, bounce. And we want you to point toward, well, I grabbed go to, point toward the mouse pointer. Okay. Now, I don't know, to be honest with you, I'm not so, I don't know about the uh, next costume. So let's go look and see. So let's grab the looks, next costume. Try it in and click it in. Now, we want this to keep happening over and over again. So now I'm going to go and get the forever piece and drag it in. So I've changed my sprite to a spooky looking bat. I am going to do the same thing I did with the shark. In other words, it's going to move on the screen following my mouse. And I'm going to click on the, uh, and hopefully it has other costumes. Because what you're doing when you put the next costume in is you're basically identifying that there's other ways that this shape is done and you're making a little flip book. So I'm going to click on that. And yay, look at that. I have a flying bat that I now can control dragging it around on the screen. Isn't that cool? I just, I think when you, when you first show this to kids, they're blown away by what you can do. I need to bring in another sprite that will be what this bat is going after. So let's go back into our sprites. Uh, let's, let's keep up the fantasy thing going here. And we could have the bat going after these little people. Or a uh, knight or whatever you want it to be. I tell you what, why don't we do the wizard 
Now the wizard becomes the sprite that the bat is trying to get. So when you bring them in to the space here, if it's too big or too small and you wanted to make it, you go up here and you click on the, the little arrows pointing in that are shrink, come down to your sprite and just click on them. And now I have the ability for my guy. If I want to make my bat bigger, notice I'm clicking down here. I come up here and I click on the make bigger and ooh, now I've got a scary looking bat. Okay, so what are we going to do about our little guy down here? How are we going to program for him? Well, we want him to disappear uh, if the bat gets him. In other words, the game will be over. So we're going to start, and by now you're starting, I hope, to see. I've got him selected so I can work on him. I'm going to go when clicked, and then I'm going to say show. which is right here under looks. Then I'm going to build something. So let's go look at what that code looks like. It wants us to repeat. That's a control, excuse me. So I'm gonna bring in my repeat block. No, I'm not. I'm gonna bring in my repeat until, excuse me. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to set something up so that it has a way to have something happen. So I'm going to go down here and I have to find my code under operations. Sorry, sensing. My bad. So under sensing, I'm now going to find the particular one where I'm going to put in this little piece of code. Right here. Okay. And then I'm going to change this because I don't want it to do anything when the when the mouse touches it i want it to do something when the bat touches it okay so when i do that i also need it for it to move so i'm going to go back up here to motion and i'm going to have it move 10 steps and as you can see he did But I also need to put what in? When he hits the edge, otherwise he just runs off like you just saw. So I'm going to put that in as well. And now I've got my little guy running back and forth. So I basically have built this one as well. What if we were to add something in here that would make it even cooler? And that might be that it would play a sound. So I'm going to put that in here, and you'll notice that it only is giving me two choices here. It can make a pop noise, or you can record a noise. Kids do love the recording noises, trust me. But if you'll notice up here, under sounds, you do have ways to uh, get to different sounds. And here they are. So you can pick a sound from here uh, that would be what you would want your, when the two get together, what's it going to sound like? And I'm going to, well, lucky for you, you didn't hear that. <laughs> I did. Now realize that when you double click on it, it puts it over into that. You get this here. So if I now go back to my scripts 
And if he touches the bat, it'll make this big symbol crash. Then he disappears. Now the screen. In other words, the bat touched him. He's lost his power. However you want the story to say. Last thing. We want to add a variable. And that way we can actually have a way to keep score. So I clicked on data. I'm going to come down here to make a variable. Now, pay attention. You want this variable only to work for our little wizard guy. So I'm going to say for this sprite only. So I'm going to say, OK. Now that I've made that, what it's going to do I need to go back and do my operations, or is it control? See, this is, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is why I like the other one so much better, because I can know, I can see what I'm doing instead of having to go back and do this stuff all over again. Okay. I am struggling a little bit here because I can't see my page. It's down here, I think. And I can't get it. All right, let's look for what we're looking for is change by one. And it should have been in here. I made a variable. Or the sprite, okay. And for some reason, it's not putting it in here for me. It should be right here. And I'm really at a loss as to why it's not right here. Huh. All right, let's go through and look. It's not a motion. It's a change. There's change X and Y, but that's not what we want looks there you go so i'm going to <laughs> you know this is the part that drives me nuts is a lot of this stuff just doesn't make a sense 
Oh, that's for changing color. So let's see. We're in the right ballpark. Change there. Change. Let's put this in here and see what happens. Change. Nope. That's not going to. A lot of you are probably sitting out there right now yelling at your computers going, Steve, it's right over there. And you know what's throwing me is because when I went into uh, data and I created that variable, and this is throwing me, it should now be here. And I don't understand why it's not here. Okay, I'm going to move on because you need to see this and I need to finish. So let's play the game and see what happens. So I have control of the bat. I come down, I get down here. And when I get the wizard and I've eaten him up, he disappears off the stage. And as you can see, the bat keeps flying until I stop it. Simple. This is going to haunt me now for the rest of the evening about not finding that. The code is change, and then there's a drop down that says, e oh, you know what? <laughs> I forgot to put a dag on title to it. That's all it was, kids. Okay, for this sprite only. Whoops. Make sure you pick the right sprite, Steve. So I'm going to be here, data, variable, eaten, duh. this sprite only. Okay. Now, now. <sighs> so every time he gets eaten, it changes it by one. Okay. Want to play it? Let's see what happens. Notice up here. Start the game. Grab the bat. Move this over out of the way. Grab your bat. Have him fly around. And we're going to go after the wizard. And we've got to catch the wizard. Come here, wizard. Boom. And I'll stop it. Now. I can hit the flag and we start all over again. Just like in any good video game, you get to start all over again. Come in here and now you have two. What is the piece that's missing? There's no background. I like doing background last because it it gets, you know, it gets distracting, gets in my way as I'm working here. So, I can come down here and click on backdrop and we need something kind of maybe spooky so let's see what castles might look like okay castles look kind of spooky uh holiday is there any kind of halloweenish looking thing not really let's go outdoors and see what we might find oh, okay in other words there's a castle Themes, we could go there. You get the idea. Oh, here we go. How about nature? Yeah. How about in the forest? Or maybe a gravel desert. I'll go forest. But so now there's the miss piece. Now, here's something interesting you can do. Move him out of the way. If you come down here and you right click on it, you can duplicate it. How many do I have now? Two. If I duplicate it again, I now have three. And so you see, I can build up a series of characters that my bat will be going after. So I come up here and I click on the, the 
And as you can see, I've got them flying all over the place and my bat can go in and grab them. That's how you put more in. Now, how would you do a Frogger like game? Well, what you could do is reverse everything. Go into your bat code. And essentially what you could do is instead of having this piece in here, you would have that piece in there. But you would have to add some motion. Let's put in some steps here. So that when we click on him, he's essentially flying back and forth, and we're trying to avoid him. To do that, we would have to go into our sprite over here, and we would have to change up this code to be where it goes to the points to the mouse pointer, just like we did before. And then that way we could have our little, we could have our guy down here. We would control him trying to, to avoid that thing. So I'm going to pull that over. And I'm going to take out that. Whoops. I'm going to take out the movement because. Okay. And now when we play the game. I am controlling him, and it's very difficult because that bat is going all over the place. <laughs> Crazy. You get the idea. So that is module, our last module, module six. Sorry for the uh, flub. I just forgot to give it a title. And then you have your own variable that you can create. By the way, those variables that were in there are uh, readily available to you. And you, when you go into the variables, uh, you're just going to give it a name. And then what it will do is it will, once you give it a name, in other words, I could call it Swan. It doesn't care. What it does is it will then give me the different things that are available to me. There is no, um, there's no way to include this or to make this bigger. Okay. So these are your only choices. I'm going to make that clear. Last thing. Let's make sure we entitle this. So I'm going to call it bats and wizards. And it's going to save it to my account that I have created. It is not shared yet. So let's go over here and share it. And there's my game. That's simple. Okay. Now, for me to get it into my Google Classroom, it's as simple as clicking on the embed. Dun, 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 dun. There it is. There is the symbol for Google Classroom. It's going to launch the Google Classroom. Um, if I haven't logged in, they'll ask me to log in. For me, all I got to do is just go in here and find my class. And it'll say, what's the action? And I can use it as a creation. I can use it, I mean, as an assignment. I can use it as a question. I can make an announcement. Okay, I'm going to make an announcement. And go. And up here, look at the cool game I made. Post. Go in, look at my class. And there it is. When I, anywhere, I can click here and click on the game screen. When I click on it, it takes me right back to where the game was, and I can play it by clicking on the flag. 
Now, last thing. Let me start closing out some of these tabs up here. The last thing we want to look at is the final. I think the final is very straightforward, that you don't need to freak out, that all I'm asking you to do is to do some reflections. Uh, someone pointed out to me that the final in the 397 uh, section in live text wasn't up to par, um, and it wasn't, mainly because when I create these things in the summer, and when people set them up for the fall classes, if they don't notice that I've changed it around and they just grab whatever year when I've taught this course, you know, things change. And I always change my courses. So, but let's look at what we've got here. So your first reflection is a very straightforward. Describe the TPAC framework process you use to develop your curricular focus for your Virtual classroom, flip classroom. We're talking about your Google Classroom here. So when you were thinking about when you were thinking about creating this, what part of the Google or what part of the TPAC framework are you focused on? Are you focused on first the content pedagogy? Are you focused on the pedagogy? In other words, doing it different ways? Or are you focused on the technology? Now Remember when I taught you this, I said, don't ever start with the technology. But if you're doing something that is about technology, guess what? You start with it. But you'll do it in a different way. In other words, you'll show kids, we're going to be using this tool called Slides that's in the G Suite. And I'm going to show you how to create a little presentation in there. Slide over to Curricular Focus. Now, I'd like you to think about creating a slide presentation on something from the curriculum. Pedagogically, I'm going to ask you to share that slide presentation in our Google Classroom so that other kids can see it and comment on it. TPAC. The second one. Describe your Google Classroom and how you designed, redesigned it to make it meet full and subscription of tech integrated classroom space, the integration of technology and pedagogy. This is straight out of the book. Is it irresistibly engaging? Is it elegantly efficient, challenging, easy to use, technologically ubiquitous, and steeped in real life problem solving? One can answer two, <laughs> if you think about it. Teaching digital natives. Now, this one's straight up, you know, where we did the cute little V on and all that. Um, what I'm looking for here is just you tell me, do you think there's, do you think there really is a digital native? And if there is, what does it mean? If you think that the digital native is kind of a fallacy, and there are a lot of people who do, um, I kind of come down in between those two ideas. I don't think kids are born with iPads, iPods, uh, iPhones in their hands. I think kids have a propensity for wanting to play with them. And then they also have a propensity early in life. They're not afraid of failure. Now, we soon change all that in school. We soon change all that in school. We make them afraid of failure. I'm sorry. You didn't get all the answers right, so you failed. I hate that. Why don't we use that as a way of teaching kids how to rethink, look at it again, straight out of the engineering mind, by the way. Failure is always a learning experience. So what happens is, after a while, kids get turned off to the whole idea and then we dump technology on them and we say oh now go out and create something well what is it supposed to be what do i have to do to get a name because i don't want to fail you see what i'm saying so that's what i'm trying to get you to do here with the, the teaching the digital native think about that technology resources what technology do you think would enable you to help students develop a deeper understanding of subjects you want to teach what technologies best fit your ideas of teaching? 
That's a TPEC idea, but what we're looking for here is all the stuff that we played with in this class. Which one of those things would you like to use in your class and why? Okay. Now it says, what technologies do you think? Well, I said that because you might have two or your favorites. You might have three that are your favorites. You don't have to go through and figure out how to answer this by putting a blend space, a padlet, a uh, Vion, a, uh, all the different tools and toys that we play. You don't have to come up with that laundry list and how you'd use it. No, no, no. That goes against the whole idea of you being a professional. Find the one that made you go cool or find the two that made you go ooh. You're then going to write about those two and say, I could see how I could use this. Now remember, remember, not only did we use tools like Vion and Blend Space uh, and pick the chart, but when we got down to putting stuff into our ubiquitous classroom, the Google Classroom, and we looked at the FET, we looked at all those different tools and that very large collection that's in that, that module, you might have found something in there that you really, really like. Fine, put it in here. This does not have to be something you created. It can be, or it can be something you found that made you go, yeah, that would be really cool to do. I will love you if you can figure out a way to include one of those tools you found in with one of the technologies that we played with. Yeah. Lastly, as you consider developing and implementing a Google Classroom virtual classroom, which step component of the Google Classroom virtual classroom do you feel most comfortable with and which one do you feel the least comfortable with? Please notice up here that the reflection should be at least three paragraphs with at least three sentences in each paragraph. Short and sweet and concise will always win the day. Now, if you're a writer like me, and someone told me to write something that it was three paragraphs and three sentences each, I couldn't do it. And that's fine. You know, three is the minimum. If you want to add more, you can. All righty. What have we learned? We have played with coding using a beginning coding tool called Scratch. We now understand that we're to build our own little Scratch game. Um, we have been given the code. And you can either use the really simple code, or if you really want to challenge, use this code. The simple code lives inside the folder. Very simple code. You're supposed to change it up some way, put two different characters in, add a different sound. Um, you can change it so that you're trying to move the fish past the shark as opposed to the shark running all over the page. And are you pulling the shark all over the page and eating the fish? You could build a frogger game where he's going back and forth and you're trying to get past it. However you want to do it, just change it up a little bit or a lot of it. It's up to you. And then the final, I hope the final isn't stressful to you. I hope it allows you just to have a chance to kind of think back on all the cool stuff that we've played with in this class and how you see it fitting into what will be your Google Classroom when you get your job and you will get a job. This will be waiting for you. People won't be talking about this in the same way that we've talked about it in this class, except for the Google Classroom specific stuff. But Jefferson County, with its deeper learning emphasis, deeper learning was created by, wait for it, wait for it, Michael Fullen. There's a book out there called Deeper Learning. So you have been touched by the magic of Michael Fullen. And by that I mean you are now a full-blown technologist. You have now tools and tricks in your teacher tool bag that you can take to your schools. I want you to feel very open to using anything that we used in this class with my username and password. Now, in things like 
pick the chart. You can go in and create your own class structure in there, folder in there. Um, same thing with Edpuzzle. You can go in and create your own folder in there so that when kids are in there working, uh, it's not a free-for-all. Uh, even in Vion, you can go into Vion and create your own folder in there, your class folder in there. I want you to use this stuff. Now, you may not get around to using it until later on. So always remember, always remember, I am here. I am here for you. Um, all you got to do, 502-457-2937. It still sounds like a telephone. I still sound like I'm asking for money. 502-457-2937. If you have forgotten totally how to do it, but you remember it being cool and you want to use it again, text me. Say, hey, Steve, I was in five. I'll know who you are. Can you help me set this up? I'd love to try it with a group of kids that I'm working with at such and such a school. I guarantee you everything that you've used in this class is allowed in Jefferson County Public Schools, Odom, Bullitt, uh, independent schools, archdiocese. So, all right. Love being with you. Uh, I, this is it. This is our last Monday. I told you I'd have you done before Thanksgiving. So if you still need me, if you want to come in, if you want to sit down with me, uh, just again, text me. We'll set up a, a time because we have still have some class meetings left. Uh, I will be using those times, frankly, to be finishing up the other classes I have where people actually have to do very large presentations and then bring them in and, and present them to me. But I can always, you know, we can always maneuver things around and fit you in. Enjoyed it. Make sure you do your evaluation of the class. Tell me the good. Tell me the bad. Tell me the ugly. I can't make it better until you tell me what needs to be better. And as always, I'll be here. I'm just a text away. Thank you all for a very wonderful class.